Uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, naive Bayes and the logistic regression, two examples of supervised uh, classification techniques. And so by the end of the day, uh, you'll be able to frame many machine learning tasks as classification problems. Uh, you'll be able to apply logistic regression to classify data, although I won't talk about how to actually learn uh, the weights for logistic regression. That's what we'll be talking about next time. And uh, you'll also learn how to do naive Bayes, another uh, classification framework, end-to-end uh, -end on real data. Okay, so first let's talk about classification a little bit. Uh, so the way classification works is you have some universe uh, that your X's come from. Uh, so this might be English documents with some vocabulary. You represent your documents in the space, and then you have some labels. Uh, and uh, this might be uh, spam or not in terms of your emails. Uh, and then from that, uh, you've labeled a bunch of documents with these labels. So you have a collection of X's and Y's uh, for all of your data points. So uh, for this email, it was spam. Uh, maybe this email was not. And what we want to do is we want to have a machine, a classifier, some algorithm that can map a combination of x and y um, to probabilities. And so today we're talking about probabilistic um, classifiers where we want to know for this email what's the probability that it is spam or not. Uh, and uh, so each individual answer should lie between 0 and 1, and all of the answers should sum to 1. This is just a definition of probability. And so uh, one thing that we'll talk about is the distinction between generative and discriminative models. Uh, so naive Bayes is the example for generative, and logistic regression is the example for discriminative. And so in this case, uh, generative models uh, model both X and Y. Uh, in the discriminative case, you're only caring about uh, Y given an X. So your probability function doesn't care as much about what X actually is. And so what naive Bayes gives you is a way of computing the probability of X and then the probability of X given Y and you'll use something called Bayes rule to turn this around into the kind of answer that we want. The name naive Bayes comes from an assumption that you'll make about the X's that we'll talk a little bit more. So logistic regression, let's break this uh, into its component parts again. So regression uh, is in its name because you're combining some weight vector with uh, uh, the vector x that's describing your data, and logistic because we'll pass it through a function that is called the logistic function that allows these answers to be probabilities. Okay, uh, any questions on the generative discriminative uh, framework? Uh, so in the case of uh, uh, naive Bayes and modeling the joint probability, uh, so in reality, it's called naive because we aren't actually computing the joint probability. Is that correct? Well, so, um, uh, we're, uh, so once you break down, so that's a good question. Once um, we're computing the joint probability of x and y, but these x's could uh, be many different things. So if, if you're looking at an email, um, you could have the word book. Uh, you can have the word jog and you can have the word shirt. Um, and so it's naive because um, when it's trying to decide the probability of the word book, it only depends on whether it is spam or not. Um, it doesn't care if you've seen jog or shirt. Uh, so it's naive in assuming that the x's have no structure, um, but uh, it does model the joint probability of y and all of the x's, uh, but uh, between any of the individual x's, uh, there is a naive independence assumption. So is it fair to say that how naive it is depends on what it is that we're modeling? Yeah, exactly, and, and so we'll, we'll talk about an example of a coin flip where it's not naive at all, and it's uh, perfectly uh, appropriate to use naive Bayes in that case, uh, but when we actually talk about documents, uh, which we'll have an example of in class, uh, uh, on a uh, homework handout, uh, then it will be much more naive. 
Okay, so let's talk about a case where naive Bayes is totally appropriate and not making any naive assumptions at all. So let's say that I have two coins, uh, C1 and C2, and uh, I, I have both of these coins in my pocket, and with some probability, I pull out a coin, I flip it a bunch of times, record the coin and the outcomes, and do that several times. And uh, so uh, I've, I've done that uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times here, uh, and we've recorded the, the coin flips for each of those. And now, uh, so, so we can think of this as, as training data. And so what is the y in this case? In this case, the y, just eyeballing it, would be c2. Uh, oh, so, so you jumped ahead. But, but just conceptually, uh, uh, what, what is the concept uh, that corresponds to the y? And, and so yes, you're exactly right. The, the y is what coin we're using. And then what's the x's? The X's are the history of coin flips for each of the coins. Exactly, yes. All right, and, and so given these training data, we want to uh, figure out for some new history of coin flips uh, which of the coins generated this. Uh, so uh, now asking the question that you wanted to answer before, uh, which uh, coin is most compatible with this coin flip history? Right, so that would be C2. Yeah, so, so C2, that, that makes total sense and still a correct answer. So why, why do you think that? Uh, because the distribution of, because there are a lot more zeros in C2 examples than in C1. Yeah, exactly. So, so we can see lots of zeros here, lots of zeros here, um, and not as many zeros in uh, the C1 cases. Uh, so, uh, so you could eyeball this, but how could we do this uh, a little bit more rigorously? Um, uh, we, we notice that there's some structure. We can, we can estimate what's the probability of each of the coins. So, um, so how, how would you do that? We, we have this training data. How could you get the probability that I pull uh, one coin versus the other out of my pocket? Uh, you could count the number of times zero or one occurred for each example, C1 or C2. Uh, right, so, so that's, that's the probability of x uh, given y, but what about just the probability of y itself? How could you do that? So I, I just want to know uh, coin 1 or coin 2, uh, which one will I pull out oh, of I see. my pocket? I see, so we would just count the number of times uh, we've seen C1 or C2. Um, if I understood the correct question. Yeah, so, so uh, uh, that, that's part of it, but if we just count up C1, so C1 happens one, two, three, four times, uh, so that's not a probability because it's greater right. than one. Divided by the total number of coins, C1 plus C2. Yeah, so, so the probability of C1 is four over seven, uh, and what would be the probability of C2? Uh, three, three over seven. Yep. All right, so, so that's easy, and, and we can put in those answers there. Um, and, and then uh, we also want to know what's the probability of observations given the y that we're trying to predict. So we, we can do a similar thing there. And so, for example, for C1, we can count up uh, the number of ones we see. One, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Uh, and then we can plug that in. 12 over 16 coin flips are heads for C1. And uh, for C2, this, this uh, bears out your intuition that uh, the probability of heads is much lower for C2 and much higher for C1. And then we can just apply conditional independence to get the probability of a complete sequence. So uh, I, I asked about uh, tails, heads, tails. We can break this into uh, the probability of uh, tails times the probability of heads times the probability of tails because each of these are independent. They just multiply. Uh, so. Uh, Given this, how can we get to this, which is what we really want? So this is going in the wrong direction. This is a probability of a, uh, an observed sequence. 
uh, given the y, but this is what we really want, y given the x. So how do we get here? Uh, for that, we would have to use the magic of Bayes' rule. Right, and, and so the Bayes' rule allows you to go from probability of A given B uh, to the probability of B given A. And hopefully, uh, oh, okay. Uh, okay, and, and hopefully uh, everyone remembers this formula from uh, probability. Uh, so, so this is just an application of Bayes' rule in this case. Uh, so uh, this is what we had before, the probability of coin flips given a class, uh, and uh, times the probability of the class. So this is uh, uh, the individual probability of each coin uh, being pulled out of the pocket. So that's why we had to compute that as well. And we need to compute the probability of heads given the coin and the probability of the coin for each of the coins. And that's all we need to do to be able to uh, figure out for a particular observation what's the probability. Okay, but uh, so on coin flips, uh, it worked out perfectly, um, but the real world is more complicated than that. So let's say that you want to uh, determine, uh, given some characterization of fruit, what fruit uh, you have in front of you. Uh, so some, some uh, ways that you might characterize your data are in terms of the color, the shape, and the size. Um, and these things are definitely not independent. So uh, for example, apples uh, that are red tend to be larger than, than apples that are green. And so if you know that the size is small, it's more likely to be green. So that's all that this is saying here. And so if we did the same math as we did before, and we want to compute the probability of some observation and uh, figure out the probability of apple and apply Bayes' rule, uh, we'd have really complicated conditional probabilities that we would need to compute. Uh, because there are many different combinations of color, shape, and size, we need to estimate that. We need to look, um, okay, of all of the round things of size 2 uh, that are green, um, uh, how many of those are apples? And, and there might not be very many of them. This makes this computationally difficult. And would you mind explaining why the equal sign became a proportionality? Uh, right, so um, uh, the equal sign became a proportionality because we got rid of this at the bottom, and this doesn't, uh, this is the same, uh, this is a sum over all of the fruits. Uh, so if we just want to know what fruit we're dealing with, uh, we can get rid of this because it'll be the same for all of it, and just compute this value for every fruit, and then just see which one is the largest. So we're doing this to make it computationally easier? Uh, yes, exactly. Um, and uh, one thing that, that you can do after you computed this for every fruit, for all fruit, uh, is that you can just take these answers and you'll, you'll have some vector. Um, and it might be like 0.9 and 4 and uh, 2. Uh, you can just figure out what the sum is, in this case uh, 7.9, uh, then just divide each of these by 7.9 and you'll get the probabilities that you wanted in the first place. Yes, all right, thanks for keeping me honest. Okay, and, and the next thing that we're going to talk about is uh, how we actually estimate probability distributions. Uh, oh, but first, uh, all right, uh, before we get to that though, uh, what we, we, we need to talk about the, the central way that naive Bayes is actually naive. And uh, the central idea of naive Bayes is that um, we have uh, various features that we can observe. Uh, so this could be, in our fruit example, what color it is, its shape, its size. We're going to assume that they're all independent given the class. So 
Uh, given that it's an apple, we have some probability of the fruit being green. Uh, we have some probability of it being round. We have some probability of it being of size 2. Uh, and we're going to assume that they're all independent, even though this is patently false. Uh, because once we know that the apple is green, the size is smaller. But we're going to assume that they're independent. And you can have large red apples uh, and large green apples uh, with fairly equal probability, even though uh, that's uh, not consistent with what we know about the world. Okay, uh, but the, the, the question that still remains is how to estimate these probabilities on real data. And that's what we're going to talk about next. Okay, so, um, so any questions before we move on? Not at present. Okay, all right. So let's say that we want to estimate the probability of the word by appearing in a spam email. So here are a bunch of words that appear in spam emails uh, collected over many different emails. So how would you go about computing uh, the probability of the word by uh, in this context? Yeah, in, in uh, uh, four emails that, that are spam. Uh, so are we assuming that this data is from a spam message? Yeah, so, all, uh, so, uh, I, uh, so pretend that we've taken all of the emails that are spam uh, and just dumped all the words into here. And uh, uh, ham lives over here, but we're not seeing those. Mm -hmm. So in this case, since we know that we're inside of a spam message, we can just count the number of times we see the word by uh, and uh, divide by the total number of words. Yeah, exactly. So in this case, we have one, two, three, <coughs> four, five buys. Uh, and then we have uh, 20 words. So uh, a quarter of the words are by. Uh, we can compute that up. And, and this is called maximum likelihood estimation. Uh, so uh, uh, this might not be reasonable in the case uh, where you have rare words. Uh, so uh, let's say that uh, uh, you had some email message with the word bagel in it. Uh, so if you had anything that looked like this, um, uh, no matter uh, what other words appeared in the message, when you uh, compute the probability of spam, uh, you'll get 0 because this is contributing to uh, some large product, and 0 times anything is 0. So the overall probability will be zero. You can never have a spam message with bagel. Uh, and uh, thus, if a uh, clever spammer uh, just put the word bagel in every spam message, all of them would get through your filter. So um, uh, for many applications, we often have some prior notion of what we believe our probability distribution should look like. Um, so we might believe that everything should be non-zero, it should be sparse, it should be uniform. Um, and incorporating this into a probability distribution uses something called maximum a posteriori, that uh, you have some prior notion of what your data should look like, and it gets combined with what you actually observe. Uh, but at a more practical level, what you can do is you can just add a little bit to what you actually observe uh, to fix these pesky zeros. And the, the thing that you add on can be called a smoothing factor, a pseudo count, things like that. Um, and uh, in the special case when this is equal to 1, uh, this is called Laplace smoothing. Uh, it also corresponds to a uniform prior, which is nice. We'll talk a little bit more about this at the end of the course. Uh, but for now, just, just apply this formula. Um, and in particular, when alpha gets smaller, this is a Dirichlet. Uh, sparse Dirichlet, and uh, there's some nice properties there that we'll talk about at the end of the course. Okay, um, so uh, any questions? Uh, I guess I'd like to ask, uh, so with Laplace smoothing or any smoothing, it seems like uh, we're allocating a lot of probability mass to things we haven't seen. Yeah, exactly, and, and, and so uh, that, that's an excellent point. Um, uh, so uh, for instance, let's, let's say that um, we have a vocabulary of, of 5,000 words. 
um, and let's say that we only have a thousand words in our data set. Uh, so in, in that case, once you add in all of the, the smoothing together, uh, only about one-fifth of our probability mass is coming from actual words that we've observed. And the rest is, is just imagined. It's hallucinated. Um, uh, and, and so that is a real issue. Um, uh, and so that, that's why uh, people have come up with, with smarter ways of doing smoothing. Uh, you can use Dirichlet priors. You can use uh, very small alphas. That works a little bit better. Um, but computationally, sometimes it's easier just to add integers to integers, and so people still do the plus smoothing quite a bit. So when we use smoothing, uh, do we have to know the full vocabulary beforehand? Uh, yes, exactly. And and so, um, well, so when we when we use the plus smoothing or Dirichlet smoothing, yes, uh, there there are more complicated things. Um, like Pittman Your uh, smoothing that allow you to have an unbounded vocabulary, um, and, and that's actually something that I've done a little bit of research on. But um, uh, the uh, the simpler answer to your question is yes, you should know your vocabulary beforehand, and uh, you only consider those as the things that get smoothing. Um, and so one corollary of that is that if you see something. A new word that you haven't seen before, you then ignore it uh, forevermore. So um, that that sometimes causes problems, but uh, when you're using spam versus ham detection, that's not as important. Good question. Okay, so now uh, we we can finally uh, uh, really define naive Bayes. Uh, so what we want from naive Bayes is the probability of a class given a document. So this is our y given our x. And naive Bayes defines this as the prior. Uh, so in the coin example, this was um, which coin I drew out of my pocket in spam versus ham. Uh, spam is much more likely than ham, so all else being equal, you'll say that uh, an email is more likely to be spam. And then this is your, your data. And so these things combine to give you some score. And you'll notice that this is a proportional to, as you asked about earlier. And so uh, before, we had uh, a normalization term where we summed over all of the classes. And so that's the same for all of the classes. So we're just going to ignore that and normalize later. So uh, to explain this a little bit more, uh, you have a product over all of your features. Uh, you have conditional probabilities for each of your features. Um, and, uh, uh, and then you have the prior at the very beginning. OK, so uh, any questions on the formula? No, I think it's clear. OK. Um, and uh, so. You, you want to find the best class, so you're looking for the class that optimizes this probability um, and will uh, sometimes, but not always, uh, write a hat over these probability estimates to denote that we've actually estimated these uh, from the training set. Uh, so uh, using Laplace smoothing or whatever, uh, so they're not necessarily true probabilities, but, but just estimates of the probabilities using uh, maximum likelihood or maximum a posteriori estimates. So are there any instances where, in this context, there's a difference between using the hat and not using the hat? Um, so usually, uh, so I'm, I'm not always uh, perfect about doing this, but um, often you'll, you'll use the hat when, uh, that when you've actually estimated it from data. Uh, and you'll not use a hat when you're just sort of talking about it theoretically. So theoretically, if I knew this conditional probability, then, then the true probability would look something like this. OK, um, and uh, so, so just to uh, recapitulate why naive Bayes is naive, uh, we're taking this joint probability of your features and breaking it down into uh, the constituent features and assuming that they're all independent so that this messy joint becomes a simple product. And then when we estimate stuff, we're going to use Laplace smoothing uh, for both our classes and our vocabulary. 
And uh, so this is an example that we'll work through in class uh, and where you'll actually compute these numbers and make some classifications. So one implementation detail uh, is that uh, often uh, these numbers will get pretty small. So if you have a very large vocabulary, the probability of a word given a class can be very small. Um, and so because small numbers can lead to underflow, uh, we often take the log. And so this becomes mathematically convenient because the log of x times y is equal to the log of x plus the log of y. Uh, so we can turn this product into a sum. Uh, and another nice thing about this is that um, addition is much cheaper than multiplication on a computer. So, so this becomes fairly fast, so long as you don't have to compute the log many times, and you can just store these numbers and keep them around. Okay, uh, any questions on that? Nope. Okay, so uh, another nice thing about this is that this looks a lot like uh, logistic regression. Uh, which we'll talk about in a second.